<laughs> oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. Welcome to the evening service here at Brian Baptist Church. We hope that you're tuned in somewhere, listening, watching. Get your Bible. Get ready for some good Bible preaching in just a moment. Uh, there, I hope you watch the services this morning uh, and got a blessing from them. Uh, I got several comments from some folk that they did get a blessing, and that's what we hope that they did. And we just want to <clears throat> keep encouraging everyone to stay close to the Lord, be much in prayer, pray for our country, pray for our president, pray for those that are standing behind him, then pray for each other, pray for our church, and pray for your uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus. Uh, we need to try to stay close to the Lord. The devil will use this opportunity when we're not assembling together uh, to get folks to begin to grow cold. And don't tell, tell me, well, preacher, it'll never happen to me. Uh, it, it can happen to anyone that doesn't stay close to God and in God's Word. And then also, uh, we are having these evening services because we believe that the church ought to have both morning and evening services on the Lord's Day. We are not going to close down Berean. Uh, I, I am so disturbed by what's happened among our Baptist churches where you drive by them on Sunday night going to church or coming from church and those big emphasis that they got, those big buildings, they're dark. That is not a good testimony for God. Amen. And uh, so Berean, uh, as long as I'm pastor, and whoever follows me, I'll do my best to see that he does the same thing. We'll never close the doors on Sunday night. Uh, five or 50 or 500. Uh, we believe people need the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And so just want to give that little commercial that Berean will uh, preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and then in any, other t any other time we want services, we'll have them. But we do not believe in closing the church doors, Baptist or what, uh, on Sunday night. So we're glad that you have tuned in, whoever you are, wherever you are. And Brother Aaron, uh, our assistant, it was a great message this morning. And tonight we're looking forward to what God's laid on his heart for us. And so wherever you might be, I hope you have your Bible. Sit back and enjoy God's word or become miserable listening to it. <laughs> you know, somebody said the other day to me, I think I said this. They said, well, uh, I, I was missing them in church. So I went to visit and they said, well... We just don't feel comfortable anymore at Berean. And I said, and I thought, where in the Bible does it say you go to church to be comfortable? Amen. Amen. You go to church to hear the word of God Amen. expounded. You go to church for to be with God's people and fellowship. Amen. You go to church to worship and praise and exalt Jesus. Amen. You're not here. For somebody to comfort you. You're here to worship God. And we invite you to do that tonight. Brother Aaron, come on and share with us whatever God has laid on your heart Amen. tonight. Amen. With an introduction like that, I almost felt like pastor should just take the service. <laughs> he really started to let it go there for a minute. <clears throat> tonight... Before we begin the actual sermon, I want to read a passage out of Proverbs chapter number 18. Proverbs chapter number 18, because this can be somewhat of a controversial subject. But the Bible reads in Proverbs 18, 13, Whoso, oh, I'm sorry, whoso reward, oh, wrong verse. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Before you decide to turn this sermon off with that answer, of shutting it down, you need to listen to what's said tonight. I believe that um, this is really important. Um, I believe this is a, a topic that many Americans stand for, um, many Christians, but there's a movement in our nation 
um, against this movement. So I ask that you don't turn off the sermon right away, but you listen to it entirely so you get a true concept of what I'm getting ready to say tonight. Right off the bat, you may disagree or, or you may think differently. Uh, you may think it's my interpretation of God's word. Um, if, if you have any questions, email us those questions afterwards. I look forward to answering each one of them. Uh, my sermon tonight is going to deal with the Second Amendment, which is something that I believe is really important in our nation. So if you would, please turn in your Bible to Luke chapter number 22, Luke chapter number 22. Luke 22. heard a lot of sermons preached on Luke chapter 22 over the years, and I feel like maybe at that time in human history, it was applicable in that way. Um, I've heard a lot of different sermons, most of them leaning towards this, speaking about the Word of God, but there's a key phrase in verse number 36 of Luke 22 um, that I believe is relevant, relevant for today. Luke chapter number 22, we're going to start our reading in verse number 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and death. This is Peter, Simon Peter speaking. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lack ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is that is written, must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words tonight, not mine, that your Holy Spirit would move. Lord, I ask that I would represent this in a godly biblical way. Lord, I believe it is biblical, and I'm going to prove that from the Bible tonight. There are a lot of reasons why we need to be able to keep our Second Amendment rights. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen why the title of my sermon tonight is Trigger Finger Gun Control. Trigger Finger Gun Control. I believe that that best suits what we're going to talk about tonight. I know that there are some that probably say Trigger Finger Gun Control. The truth of the matter is if you don't pull the trigger, you have control of your firearm. So it is up to the individual to make the decision whether they take life or whether they let someone go. That's why the title is Trigger Finger Gun gun control. So in Luke chapter number 22, verse number 36 and 37, the first thing I want to go over is, what time is it? What time is it? And the Bible is crystal clear in Luke chapter 36, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. There's a reason why Jesus is telling the disciples to prepare. Verse 37, for I say unto you that this is that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was a reckon, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. I believe that after Jesus went to the cross, he was buried and he rose again. He knew things would get worse on this planet before they'd get better when he returned. Now, I believe that he's always had a defensive plan for his people. The entire Bible's loaded with it. But unfortunately, today in America, there are too many pastors that have beat around the bush. They've been on the fence. They haven't made a stand of the importance of our Second Amendment rights. Now, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment is, Congress shall make no law representing an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Without our Second Amendment right, we lose our freedom of religion. Or abridging the freedom of speech. Without our Second Amendment right, we lose our freedom of speech. Look at the rest of the world today. Look at your China. 
Look at your North Korea. Look at all these nations that have lost their freedom to speak. Or of the press. I feel like we've lost that one, though. Honestly, the press has done a horrible job. Horrible. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Therefore, the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. And I want you to notice something tonight. I feel like our Second Amendment is being infringed continually. That Second Amendment doesn't say anything about hunting and fishing. Because that's what people used to do for dinner. That Second Amendment is speaking of us keeping and bearing arms and organizing each other and ourselves peaceably that we may make a stand against tyranny. Tyranny has destroyed and killed millions around the world. We'll get into that, to, to that tonight. But before we go to the other passages, I want you to keep this thought in your mind and, hold, and, and tear off a little piece and put it in your Bible in Luke chapter number 22, verse number 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. Keep that in your mind tonight. But the first thing I want to talk about is what time is it? What time is it? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'll tell you what time it is. It's perilous times. It's dangerous times. It's time when all kinds of sin is starting to run rampant and people have no regard for human life. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse number one, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. They covet what you want. They'll come in and take it. You have no, uh, if they take your guns, you have no ability to defend your property. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. How many parents have died at the hands of their children these days? We've read countless stories. Unthankful, that's just about everybody. Unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. They can't contain themselves. Fierce, fierce. They have no mercy. They're merciless. I wonder how many out there tonight Remember the story of the 70-year-old lady coming from Bible study, going out to her car after church, and it was dark in, this, in, this, in the city of Nashville in Tennessee, and, and a guy pulled up, and he beat her and took her purse in front of a church. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's one of the reasons why many people aren't in church tonight. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. But the worst part is yet to come. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jamis and Jambes withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Look, Jeremiah chapter 6 says, Reprobate silver shall men be called, for the Lord has rejected them. When somebody has lost their conscience, when somebody has lost their mind, they're capable of some of the most heinous acts. What time are we living in today? Turn in your Bible to Titus chapter number 1. Titus chapter 1. That's only one page to the right of my Bible. See, here's the problem, Christian. Verse number 15 of Titus chapter 1, verse 15, unto the pure, all things are pure. The problem is, is we don't have a depraved mind. We don't think like they do. You don't think like the common criminal who wants to kill your family or come in and abuse your wife or your children. You don't think like that because unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They've lost their com conscience. There's a book by Dr. Robert Hare called Without Conscience. He's the one who wrote the psychopathy checklist. That's the checklist which all prisons who in their psychological departments decide whether a person is fit to go back into society or not. 
He's a Canadian guy, and he thought that maybe by chance he could diagnose and, and save the world with his psychopathy checklist. Come to find out, he proved the fact that people can cross a line and their conscience can be seared. Verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, being an abominable is being like a beast, like an animal. They're, they're not able to discern right from wrong, just like your dog can't. And disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. I believe in the last days, which we're fastly approaching, there will be many more reprobates running around this country. You can already see it. You can already see the depravity. You can already see the unconsciousness of some of the people, the way that they look, the way that they act. It's like the lights are on, but nobody's home. That's what it's like. They love themselves, and they can't contain themselves. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 5, Ephesians chapter number 5. I'm laying a foundation here, Christian, why you should defend your family, why you need to be a man. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 13, the Bible reads, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Hey, we need to wake up. And the next part is really important. See then that ye walk circumspectfully, not as fools, but as wise. Why? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Evil. And I feel like when you're out in the world today with all the maniacs running around, you almost have to walk around with eyes popping out of the back of your head. Most of the time, you don't even feel safe in places at night anymore. It used to just be certain parts of town, but most people are on edge even after dusk, even in some of the best places in America. I can think of how many times my family, when they've gone grocery shopping without me, have felt very uncomfortable. Either a guy or some weird group of people will stare at them and they'll, they'll follow them through the store. I've got countless stories of my kids calling me and telling me these things and, and me wanting to react. But this topic needs to be brought to the light. We have a duty, men, and we need to wake up. We need to be, have you ever heard this verse? Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. See, a snake only bites when it's startled and pushed back into a corner. We need to be wise as a serpent. We're not going out looking for a fight. Trust me, we don't need to do that. But if we're backed into the corner with the defense of our family, you best be ready to fight. You best be ready to fight. You want to know when I'm going to fight? When you corner me, I'll fight. Why? Because verse number 21, ironically, God has this in a really neat order. Submitting yourselves in verse 21, one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be subject unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Hey, husbands, if you want to know why your wife's not following your leadership, it's because she knows you won't lay down your life for her or you're not following Jesus the way you should. You follow Jesus like a man and your wife will follow your leadership. Doesn't mean she's going to worship you. But the woman who knows her husband's answering to God knows he's going to make the best decisions. And you know what? She also knows those are his decisions to make, and he's accountable, and she's not. That's why God put it in our hands to make these decisions. But make no mistake, you need to love your wives. How can you love someone you can't defend? How can you love someone you can't even defend? 
you know, I, I started thinking about this and this is kind of off topic. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, man. If you're like that weak husband of the governor of Michigan, if, if you're letting your wife out there run the show while armed men are protesting peaceably at the Capitol and you're hiding behind your wife, what kind of man are you? You're weak. You're weak. How can you stand? How can you protect someone you're hiding behind? Letting her do all the dirty work. What kind of man does that? Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You love your wife like you love yourself. She's got nothing to worry about. Women, if your husband loves you like he loves himself, you got nothing to worry about. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, that means notwithstanding. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This sermon really isn't about husbands and wives. It's more about husbands protecting their wives and being willing to lay down their life for their wife. If you love your wife, man, you're going to put a wall between her and any harm that could come. And see, the problem is, is we've been brainwashed today to think that guns kill people. That's why I said trigger finger gun control. Let me tell you something right now. A gun is a great equalizer. Someone comes into your home. I may best one of them. I may get a hold of two of them. But I'll tell you what, if there's more than that, I'm in trouble. And a gun makes it a level playing field. And that's what we need to keep in mind tonight. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter number one. Turn in your Bible to Joshua chapter number one. Joshua is probably one of the, my favorite people in the entire Bible. Maybe we both have a warrior spirit. I don't know what it is, but I really enjoy Joshua. Verse number 13, the Bible reads, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave on this side of Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them. There's your first militia. Why? Because there's always going to be a wickedness, a tyranny, a tyrant who's going to come and try to disarm you. That's the whole reason why we broke away from England. But we've forgotten our history tonight. The devil wants to disarm you because he's a murderer. And the minute he can disarm you, men, he's going to take your family one way or another. You know what? If you're an unarmed Christian tonight, I recommend you buy a sword. So your wife and kids feel safe. They at least deserve that. They at least deserve that. I get so fired up about this and I get to thinking about people that want to abuse people. And I think, praise God, if you come in my house, you better pray I use a gun. Come in after my wife and my kids. Amen. Verse 15, until the Lord hath given your brethren rest as he hath given you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it. But let me tell you something, peace isn't free, is it? Someone always has to pay for it. And right now, we're starting to lose a lot of our freedoms. And when we lose our freedoms, we'll lose our peace. And we need to be really careful. You know, Jesus, when he spoke to the disciples, when he said, in the last days, perilous times shall come, he didn't say, 
when the serial killer comes or when the riot takes place in Los Angeles in the 90s. The only personal property was, that wasn't destroyed in the LA riots were those that were armed on the rooftops with their AR-15s. When the rapist comes, when the pedophile comes, hey, when the Hitlers come, when the Stalins come, when the Mao Say tongues come, when those people come, the first thing they did was disarm the population before they took them to the prison camps. Listen, I know there's some in there today or in the uh, online world. Let's turn to Romans chapter 13 real quick because there's a misquotation of this verse more now than ever before. And it's been the drum beating by these weak pastors who are afraid to stand up. Do you realize that pastors were the leaders in our revolutionary war? They were called the Black Robe Brigade. They would carry their pistols under their garment. They'd have their King James Bible in one hand. They'd have their flintlock pistol in the other. And after the service, they'd gather the militia and they'd do battle to free us from the tyranny of England. But nobody knows about that anymore. Nobody thinks about that anymore. Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are, of, are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinances of God, and they, res and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. But let me tell you something today. There's a higher power than your government, and that higher power is God Almighty. You are not doing your family justice by not protecting them. It's your job to protect them. You know, a lot of times people don't tend to think these things through. They see passages like this and they try to apply it to every situation in their life. Oh, obey the government at all times. Yeah, like when you're speeding. Nobody ever does that. Obey the government at all times when you take that extra charitable contribution that's questionable. Obey the government at all times. There's a higher power, and that's what we need to obey. You know, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for everything. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and God is the highest power. You know, it's funny. A lot of times people, when they interpret this verse, they think it applies to all rulers at all time. But in the book of Hosea, chapter number eight, the Bible says you have set up kings, but not by me. So let me ask you a question. Is the Antichrist, when he eventually comes, is that what God wants for humanity? No. Interpreting this verse to where you just constantly submit to governments when they go over and overstep their bounds of your freedoms and your right to defend your home and your property and your wife and your children, that's bad doctrine. <clears throat> but there's more. Brother Aaron, aren't we all always supposed to just, just always take the wrong? Well, <clears throat> I had this question posed to me. So turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm just going to quickly go glance through a few of these. Because a lot of people, they automatically think that God just wants the Christian to just fall down and throw his legs up and just automatically allow his family to be killed and abused and his property taken and he's just supposed to constantly fall down and just let it happen. And a lot of times the world will use the Bible against us. In Matthew 5 verse 38, the Bible says, Ye have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So how does this conflict with your right to keep and bear arms? You know what Gandhi said? He said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Yeah, I guess that's what a God-hating pervert would say. Look into who Gandhi is and you'll know why I call him a pervert. Luke chapter number six. I like to get both scenes of the crime. Because I need to know who I'm going to turn my other cheek to. Is it an abusive, tyrannical government I turn my cheek to? Like in North Korea where they slaughtered 50,000 Christians? I hope that freak is dead. 
I hope that the reports are true and he's gone to, to the judgment and then he's been cast in hell already. I hope it's true. 50,000 of your brothers and sisters in Christ have been starved and tortured to death at his hand. Luke chapter number six, verse 27. But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. I believe the eye for an eye Jesus was trying to tell him was this. When you have a personal enemy, a personal enemy. And I think when I taught on this a long time ago, I used Brother Buddy in our church. He may be listening tonight. See, if Brother Buddy and I don't get along, which we do, thank God, and he were my enemy, I would turn the other cheek to win him to Christ. I would turn the other cheek in the hopes of setting a good example for him. If he got angry at me and he smote me in the face, I would turn the other cheek. Why? Because he's my personal enemy and I should love my personal enemy. And I should try to win them to Christ as the best I can. But see, Adolf Hitler was not my personal enemy. Joseph Stalin was not my personal enemy. They were a tyrannical government that tried to take away the arms so that they, he could perform mass genocide and kill millions of people. And there's a difference between my enemy, a son of the devil who hates humanity. There's a difference between those who hate me and those that hate the Lord. There is a very distinct difference. And that's why in the last days perilous times shall come. Because eventually there's going to be groups and hordes of people that will do whatever it takes to push an agenda that will have your head in a noose, maybe. We can see it right now. The, the, the division in our nation is great. People hate each other. These quotes about Jesus turning the other cheek is actually a quote out of Lamentations chapter number three. Let's turn there. Lamentations chapter three, between Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Lamentations three. Lamentations chapter number three. Verse number 27. The Bible reads, It is good for a man that he bear the, the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he has borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth, mouth in the dust. If so, be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. You know, Jesus was right to say, turn the other cheek if you can win somebody to him. Always take the wrong, Christian, if you can. But make no mistake, there's a difference between taking the wrong and being abused and your family being abused. I'm going to only use one of the three passages on an eye for an eye. Turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Let's just let the Bible do some of the speaking tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. I like to make sure what I'm saying is true. I don't want to just spout off a lot of my opinions. But I'll tell you this right now. It's not in my opinion that God wants you to protect your wife and your children. That is not my opinion that God wants you to protect this nation. That is not my opinion. That's biblical. Matter of fact, I'm required to love my wife and lay my life down for her if need be. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse number 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. If any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. We've heard that many times in the New Testament. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. 
before the priest and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make different inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother. So shall ye thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thy eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And Jesus is saying, we should forgive in that case. How many people have lied against you, made you look bad? How many people have bore false witness at work so that the blame isn't put on them? Jesus is saying, look, you're a personal enemy. You're to forgive. That's who you forgive. But when a maniac comes in to a grocery store to light it up with an automatic or semi-automatic weapon, you can't always wait for the police to react. That's why we have a Second Amendment. When a maniac, or if a maniac who comes into churches ever came into our church, he'd meet opposition immediately and be dealt with. Why? Because we're commanded to defend ourselves. I'm going to show you that here in a minute. The other two passages, if you want to look it up on your own time, is Exodus 21, 24 and Leviticus 24, 20, talking about your personal enemy and an eye for an eye, if you want to know where those are. You know, we're to use our force in self-defense. You know, ironically, around most of the capitals around this nation, there's been protesters, a lot of guys with a lot of intimidating weapons. I got to admit, I'm a gun guy. I like looking at the guns they carry. I like looking at it. I can't help it. But do you realize how many guns and how many people have shown up with guns and not what person has been shot? Why? Because they're exercising their trigger finger gun control. Because the God's honest truth, unlike what your freedom of press has, where your news media is lying to you, they want you to believe everybody's toting a gun and everybody who has a gun is a bad person. There's thousands of them in America standing at the capitals with a more hardware than many have in the military. And yet one shot has not been fired. Not one shot. Remember when I told you to think about Luke chapter number 22, the two swords? When Jesus, when they said unto him, we have two swords, and Jesus said, it is enough. See, I believe that there's nothing in here by accident. Nothing in the Bible is accidental, coincidental, or incidental. There's a reason why there just so happens to be two swords in the Bible, and Jesus speaks of it, because he's the author of this book. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. 1 Samuel 13. First Samuel chapter number 13. Oh, that's why I'm in 2 Samuel. <laughs> Verse number 15, the Bible reads, And Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal into Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth to Ophrah, unto the land of Shul. And another company turned the way to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the way of border that looketh to the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. And I want you to notice something, that God put this in his word so that we can learn a lesson today. The Bible reads, and there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. But the Bible should say now, if it was written today, the way that the liberals want to remove your right to keep and bear arms, that there is no gun shop found in all of America. 
And that's what they would like this book to say. But I'm telling you right now, we need to stand up for our right to keep and bear arms or I won't be able to stand up here and preach the word of God freely. And it's the same thing that the devils always said using the Philistines. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. Look, the bad guys always want you to be disarmed. Nothing's ever changed. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And let me tell you something. We need to be really careful who runs the world, who runs our country, who runs the nations, who runs the UN, because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We need to be really on guard tonight. They always say, let us disarm you. It's good. We'll protect you. Anytime a government says that, it's because they want to control you. But still, verse 20, but all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his ax and his mattocks. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. The truth is, they still made weapons to fight. The Bible says in Exodus 15, verse 3, the Lord is a man of war, even the Lord. We are created in the image of God. The Bible's filled with men who have defended their nation. The Bible's filled with men and women who have defended their homes from evil. But you're not taught that there's pure evil today. You're not taught that. But there's pure evil running around. And I believe we're starting to see the face of it. Verse 22. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. Ironically, though, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son, was there found. What's the Bible saying? There were still two swords in Israel. And Saul and Jonathan had them. I believe Jesus put that in the Bible to give us this example of why we need to protect our right to keep and bear arms. God was saying, Jesus was saying, hey, listen to me. There's coming a time when they're going to try to take your ability to defend yourself. There's coming a time when wickedness is going to run rampant before I return. There's coming a time when people are going to get in power that shouldn't be there. They're going to claim they're doing it for your good and for your protection. And they're lying to you. Let God be true and every man found a liar. Don't trust me. Trust this book. Trust the Bible. I'm just a man. I make mistakes. There's two swords. And because Jesus says that's enough, it should draw us back into the Bible for the example. Because 1 Corinthians 10 said, it happened as examples and was written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Look, I'll tell you right now, we can see the end and it's not that far away. At least I don't think so. You know, people criticize and say, well, you know, maybe your theology is wrong. We should just lay down and let governments run all over us. And if we did that, America would never be a nation today. Never. Do you realize throughout history, the men and women of America who have had their right to keep and bear arms have kept our freedom alive? Do you realize that the only thing that kept America from a land invasion from the Japanese was the Japanese general saying, I would never go there for I would find a rifle behind every blade of grass? If you take how many people own firearms and how many firearms are in the United States of America, we have the largest standing army in the world. In the world. China has more people, but they can't arm them. They don't have enough guns. We have 85 million just registered, not to mention the 100 million that aren't. I'm telling you right now, we need to defend 
our right to keep and bear arms. We need to defend our right of freedom of religion. We need to defend our right to meet peaceably. We need to defend these rights because the devil wants to take them away. The devil wants to take them away. This isn't a very long sermon, but I hope no one tuned out based on the topic, but I'm sure there were some. I mean, what do you think you're going to get from a Baptist preacher? Amen. I'll tell you what you're going to get. You're going to get the truth. Right. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to do my best to deliver the truth every time. I'm not going to try to tickle your ears. I wasn't taught to do that. As a matter of fact, I have no formal training at all. I just obey this book. And I'll tell you right now, if we don't start standing up for our rights, we're going to lose them, starting with this one. And if we lose this one, we'll lose the others. And you think waiting in line for toilet papers become a catastrophe? When you don't have the right to defend yourself, it's going to get much, much worse. It'll get much worse. How many Germans wish when Hitler turned on his own people, they still had their arms? How many people wish in Russia when Stalin turned on them that they still had their firearms? How many in China wish they had their firearms when Mao Zedong turned on them? How many Israelites wish they had a sword when the Philistines broke their promise of protection? How many? I'll tell you this. I'm not going to lose my right. I'll go down protecting it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would touch our hearts, help us to be strong, to make good decisions. Lord, help us all to have restraint. Firearms can be dangerous. Help us to use good moral judgment, Lord. Help us to stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves. Help us to do good, to do right. Help us to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to love our personal enemies. Help us to love those that we would think are less worthy. Help us to defend them. Help us to defend our churches. We're losing good Baptist churches every day. And during this pandemic, during this time of trial, I'm sure there are many pastors who have already placed it in their heart that they're going to throw in the towel. Lord, strengthen those men. Strengthen them. Give them one last adrenaline rush to fight. Prick their hearts, Lord, that they don't quit. If there's those on the fence to throw in the towel, not having a Wednesday night or a Sunday night service or to abandon Sunday school, Lord, help, it, help, help those men. Help them to make the right decision. Because pastor hasn't shut the doors on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or a Sunday school, it's given me the opportunity to teach. And there are many young men out there that need those opportunities. We ought to take advantage of those. We need to be open more, not less. Lord, I ask that you be with our leadership, that they make good decisions. Lord, I ask that you be with our people and the Christians around this, na this great nation and around the world. Help them to stand up for their rights and their freedoms. Our Constitution has given us our God-given right to be free. And you want us to be free. One day we'll be totally free and we won't have to worry about war. We won't have to worry about fighting. We won't have to worry about defense because the whole earth and the whole world will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. But until then, Lord, help us to be strong because there are perilous times and they're here right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah.
Another great day in the house of God. Another great message from the Word of God. And wherever you are, I hope you can shout out a hearty amen. We here at Berean are not ashamed to be Americans. We believe in our country. We believe in our president. We believe that we have the right kind of government. We're, uh, we're in a mess, but God is still on the throne. Amen. <clears throat> Before we dismiss, um, I'd like to make one last appeal. <clears throat> if some of you will do this to help us, we would appreciate it. I'm talking about right now to some of our members and some of you who are watching, if uh, you are in contact with some of the members that cannot watch uh, the program, the service, I've, I've been calling and I've been asking every, every family I've called to do one thing. And that is to begin to pray that God will give us the wisdom when we need to resume our services. Amen. I don't want to make a wrong decision. God forbid. I don't want us to resume too early. I do not want us to resume too late. I want us, when we open our church back for assembly, that we will feel that we're in the will of God of doing it. So if you will covenant with me to pray that in the next couple of weeks or so, God will give us the guidance and the wisdom to know whether we need to resume, when we need to resume, or not. It's a great decision to make. I want to get the input of the church, if at all possible, as much as, as much as possible. So I'm asking you somehow, call me, call Brother Aaron, email us, if you will, do something. Give us an idea what the what you the church are thinking about this we need to know the flow of the thoughts of the people that we might make the right decision to open up the church let me say this to settle it if and when however it is down the road if and when we do, for at least the time being, we'll follow the guidelines our president has laid out. We'll do our best to keep the distance between people. We are a great loving church here at Berean. And this is a hard thing for me as pastor because I love my people. I love to hug them, shake their hands, tell them how much I love them. But we will dispense from shaking hands. We will try to keep people as separated as possible for a, a reasonable season whenever we do resume. We'll try to follow the guideline of the governor of Georgia. We do not want anyone to come if they're not comfortable. If they're uneasy about it, stay home until God gives you the green light. So, you know, we, nobody will be judged. Nobody will be looked down upon if and when we do resume that you feel like you could not assemble at that particular time. So we need your help, folks. We want to make the right decision want to do it at the right time and we want God's people to be involved in it so please somehow or another some of you give us an idea what you're thinking because this involves the whole church we could say right now we're going to start next Sunday but that's not that's not right 
We need to get the feel of the church in as much as we possibly can to know what to do when the time comes to do it. We have been talking about May the 10th. Well, that's coming quick, a lot quicker than we think. I'm not sure that will be the day to do it right now. 100% sure? No, I'm not. But I hope you'll help us as we look forward to that day when we'll do it. So that's as pastor, I'm appealing to you. I'm asking you somehow, some way, let us know what some of the feeling of the church is about this. We need, the bottom line is we need to resume services somewhere down the, down the road. Amen. Amen. Somewhere we must do it. It's inevitable. We cannot go on just like the nation cannot go on as it is. There has to be some time a decision's made that this is what we're going to do. But, Brother Aaron, I'm not a dictator. This is your church. It's your, some of yours decision, what, uh, how you feel, what we might ought to do. I, a pastor, I'm appealing for some input because I want to resume services. But I want to do it right. I want to do it on God's time. And I want to have confidence in my heart that we're doing it at the will of God. So thank you. Thank you again, brother. A great, great message. Father, go with us to our homes now. Watch over our people throughout this week. Thank you for keeping our people safe. God, I really believe that you, your hand is upon us to stay in that we do not have folks that are uh, under a ventilator right now. We do not have folk that are uh, really under the siege of this. And I praise God for that. We do have folks not feeling well. We pray for them. We pray God for again for Brother Don Moore and Pat. And pray for them. Pray for uh, uh, Pat uh, Croy uh, and the family there. Pray for Sister Bonnie and Brother Gail and many others. Pray for Miss uh, Sherry and Jim uh, and the problem that uh, they're facing. God, I pray for the daughter. You touch her. Wake her up. Speak to her. God, we, we pray you'll watch over her. She's in the hospital, and we pray, God, you'll watch over her. And there's many others of our church family. But, Lord, we look forward to the day that you'll give us a green light. We'll be comfortable to assemble ourselves in God's house. As the Bible says, that's the manner we ought to do. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.